Hello everyone, welcome to a meeting of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization. We're holding this meeting virtually. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself and include your first name, last name, and affiliation if you have one. Please do not unmute or mute yourself. The host will take care of that. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of the screen and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom. The presenters will then call on the participants and unmute their microphone. If you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Rosine Foley via the chat box or at rfoley, F-O-L-E-Y, at ctps.org, or you can call her at 857-702-3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards, and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Regine Foley of the MPO staff at rfoley at ctps.org or by calling her at 857-702-3704. So, Regine, please call the roll. Um, David, it turns out Rasheen's having some trouble, so I, I will actually do it. So Okay, John, call the roll. All right, Mass <laughs> DOT Chair. David Moeller, I'm here. Thank you. Mass DOT Seat 2. John Bouchard, I'm here. Thank you. Mass DOT Highway Division. John Romano, here. Thank you. MBTA? Samantha Silverberg, here. Thank you. Uh, Mass Massachusetts Port Authority. Okay, uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Eric Barassa here. Thank you. Uh, MBTA Advisory Board. Brian Kane present. Thank you. Uh, Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Hunter Dickens here, good morning. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, BTD. Did I hear Tom Kansas? Well, you, I, I, you said BPD. Jim should be on. Uh, oh, no, I said B. I'm Tom sorry. Kansas. I said BTD. BTD. Oh, I'm sorry. Trans sorry. My, I, my apologies. Tom Kansas, City of Boston, representing Mayor Martin Walsh. Thank you. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, City of Boston, BPDA. OK. Uh, we'll come back. At large city, city of Everett. Hey, sorry. Um, oh, there's Jim. Some, sorry about that. For some reason, I had to unmute myself as well, but whatever. Um, Jim Fitzgerald with the BBTA representing Mayor Walsh, City of Boston. Thanks. Okay, great. Th thank you. Um, at large city of Everett. Yeah, uh, Jay Monty representing Mayor DeMaria and the city of Everett. Thank you. Uh, at large city of Newton. David Kozis representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the city of Newton. Thank you. At large city, at large town of Arlington. Daniel's just entering now. Okay, I'll come back. Uh, at large town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton for the town of Brookline. Thank you. Uh, Inner core committee, city of Somerville. Uh, uh, Tom Bent representing Mayor uh, Joe Curtitone, city of Somerville in the Inner core committee. Thank you. Um, Miniman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton. Okay. Um, I will go back to uh, at large Town of Arlington. Daniel Amstutz, Town of Arlington, representing Select Board Chair John Hurd, representing MPO Area Towns. Great, thank you. Uh, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Thatcher Kieser representing Mir Spicer, present. Thank you. North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Okay, uh, North Suburban Planning Council, City of Woburn. Yes, good morning, Tina Cassidy, representing Woburn Mayor Scott Galvin, 
and MAPC's North Suburban Planning Council. Great, thanks. Uh, South Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Okay, Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Pete Pelletier, Town of Medway. Thank you. Uh, Three Rivers and a local council, Town of Norwood, Neponset River Regional Chamber. Good morning, Tom O'Rourke from the Town of Norwood, representing the TRIC subregion. Thank you. And our ex officio members, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway. Uh, and Federal Transit Administration. Uh, and that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is the chair's report, and I don't have one today, so we'll go to executive director's report. Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome everyone. Um, I will try to be brief because we have a lot on the agenda today, but um, I do want to give you a few updates on our outreach and events um, that we carry out around these MPO meetings. Um, but first, I do want to say that as I announced at the last MPO meeting, um, today is Scott Peterson's last day with CTPS, the staff to the Boston Region MPO after roughly 30 years. So please wish him well. Um, he had asked for no virtual send offs. So this is sort of your opportunity to see him before he goes, but we'll try to bring him back to give him a belated send off when we're um, back in person. And then sort of related to that, um, saying goodbye to Scott, I, we also put a pause on our data strategist recruitment um, to focus first on the advertisement for the position to replace Scott. Um, it's not a full replacement. It's very difficult to do that. So we are refining the role into being a director of projects and partnerships. So if you or anyone you know might be interested, please check our website for more information. Um, the job posting will close on February 26th. So in terms of a few events, um, this week in particular, we had some great events. First of all, as you've heard about, we had the equity task force meeting on February 2nd. Um, there were 15 stakeholders who attended and MPO um, talked with them because they work so closely with equity populations. And we intended to um, discuss with them how to sort of formate this equity task force and make it meaningful. So to do that, we discussed how they um, approach equity in their own work. Um, and their ideas on how the task force could help elevate equity in the MPO's work and decision-making process. So um, as we promised at a future MPO meeting, we will come and um, staff will come and talk to you a little bit more about what came out of the meeting and talk about next steps with you. We also this week, yesterday on February 3rd, had our Southern UZA MPO coordination meeting. So that's where um, multiple MPOs in the Southern section of our urbanized area, we get together and that includes Old Colony Planning Council, um, SERPED, the Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development District, um, and we discuss various transportation planning and coordination efforts. Um, so we talked about the Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, we talked about the Federal Certification Review. I believe SERPED was just reviewed. We talked about kind of action items, um, things that we shared, things that are different, and we talked about regional studies um, and projects and public participation efforts. So just so you know, we are talking with the other MPOs and coordinating. Um, we gain a lot from that coordination and Scott had traditionally facilitated these meetings. So we will be having others take over those in the future. And we will um, also, we slow down a little bit in the COVID pandemic and we hope to sort of increase that frequency a bit. Um, a few other events worth mentioning. First of all, last week, staff presented at the Metro West Regional um, Collaborative Subregional Meeting um, with MAPC and discussed UPWP study ideas and also talked generally about transportation priorities. Um, on the UPWP side, there is a live UPWP survey right now to gather ideas for those discrete studies that you discuss each year, um, as well as technical assistance. So please send in your ideas if you haven't already and share that, that um, survey with your networks. If you want to or prefer to, you can also always reach out to Sandy Johnston directly if you'd like to talk about those study ideas. Um, another live survey we have going on right now is about um, the MPO election process and is part of the review that you all are engaging as part of that process. So it's really kind of about your awareness of and engagement in the election process. And if you haven't responded, please do. And please encourage others in the region, especially those who aren't directly represented on the board now, um, to provide their responses. And then um, one last very exciting item is please save the date for what will be a, the launch of the MPO funded um, series of forums that we are um, hosting jointly um, about travel demand management or TDM in a post-COVID world. 
So the first one will be hosted jointly with NAPC on Thursday, February 18th at 2 p.m. I know that's a bit of a double duty day with an MPO meeting in the morning and the forum in the afternoon, but um, we really do think it will be exciting and valuable. Um, for those of you who may not know, TDM is a way to, to implement strategies that reduce drive alone trips and shift people to walking, biking, and taking transit. Um, so we already have a lot of signups um, and we have a panel of TDM experts and we'll talk about how you implement policies, how those policies work in Massachusetts, um, both in urban and suburban locations and sort of how does the need for TDM change when we have more people working from home in the future. And that is all for the outreach updates. Um, I don't think I have to say too much about today's agenda. We'll have um, the roadway safety targets and we'll launch into the TIP um, updates and talk about the financials um, for this new round of the TIP. And um, hopefully we will have time so that Sarah Philbert can also give an update on Metro Common, which is MAPC's 2050 regional plan. And I think that is all we need next. I'll just mention, so you have it in your mind, although Matt will remind you that next meeting we'll talk more about TIP project scoring. Um, so this is just our first conversation. With that, I'm happy to take any questions or move along, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tegan. Any questions for Tegan? Seeing none, the next item on the agenda is public comments. If there's a member of the public who would like to comment at this time, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Okay, so the first person I see with their hand raised is, let's see, Eric Johnson. Thank you. Can you see and hear me? Yeah, please state your name for the name for the record if you have an affiliation if you have one. Absolutely. Uh, Eric Johnson. I'm the city engineer for the city of Framingham. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, yeah, uh, the MPO reached out to us uh, just to you know, give a little word about some of the uh, cost increases that's been observed in our current TIP projects. Um, speaking firstly about the Union Ave project. The Union Ave project, uh, we acknowledge, went, uh, had a slight cost increase between the 75 and 100 percent cost estimate from 9.2 million to 9.7 million, which is really the majority of which is actually this increase on MassDOT's unit items um, for inflation, such as gravel burrow, crushed stone, and pavement. Um, it's still well below the initial 25 percent estimate of uh, 10.6 million because the city took on the burden of uh, concrete base removal. Um, in excess of over a million dollars there when they did the utility projects. So we're still well under the initial cost estimate, but there was a kind of a marginal cost increase at that point, uh, again, due to mass DOT inflation. Um, there's also a central edge project I talk about where actually it's, cost, it's the engineer's cost estimate went from 1.72 to $1.98 million, around a $200,000 cost increase, um, largely due to this some increased scope of full death reclamation due to the project. Um, there's an indication MassDOT's cost estimate of 2.5 million. We're not entirely sure where that came from. We wish to kind of further engage MassDOT. Um, that might just be some inflation of their uh, units, but you know our engineer's estimate still remains under 2 million for that project. And that's all, and I'll be around to answer any further questions when you just if if and when you discuss those projects. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Next up is Jessica Whitehead. Hi, my name is Jessica Whited. Thanks for the chance to speak to you. I am a direct abutter and a homeowner. A directly abutting this proposed linear path project in Belmont, a bicycle uh, path project. And I just wanted to register the fact that I have um, still some very serious and unaddressed concerns about this project. Um, and at the top of the list are the 24-7 lighting that has been proposed and the disruption um, that will make to the humans that surround the project, as well as the preservation of existing trees and the concern about water runoff and flood risk. In addition, I'm also concerned about privacy and numerous other issues, but those three are the top ones. And I just wanted to um, note that these remain unresolved and that the program planners were supposed to meet with us individually and um, despite giving them our availabilities, they never made that happen. Um, so anyway, I would like to register that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up is Mark Ryan of Norwood. Can you unmute him, please? Good, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning to yourself and the members of the uh, MPO. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity here in Nod. We have two projects in federal fiscal year 22. And one of them is the intersection of Route 1 and University Ave. 
Um, right now, that project uh, uh, recently had a comment resolution meeting. Plans are being updated. Utility site meetings forthcoming, as well as a uh, design public hearing. This is important uh, intersection, which Norwood has been working towards since 1998, when CTPS did a study of of this intersection and identified it as needing uh, uh, serious improvements. And we've funded three traffic studies to get us to this point. We've leveraged uh, with the nearby development to get the project designed. Um, we look forward to this project staying on the federal fiscal year 22 uh, TIP schedule, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. We also have a second project, uh, uh, Upland Road, Prospect Street, Fulton Street. We've uh, identified that, and this is on uh, State Route 1A. And it, uh, it's a serious uh, safety issue. Traffic signals are being designed. 75% uh, design drawings were submitted. Uh, we are looking for, uh, uh, you know, for this project to stay on the, the federal fiscal year 22 tip. It was on 21, but additional uh, requirements from Mass EOT push it out to 22, but we really like this to stay on the 22 tip as well. Um, in your little uh, forms there, that it, it talks about a site driveway under a section 61 finding. This is on the northern limits of our tip project. Uh, the section 61 uh, require the developer to install signals once uh, warrants were met, they have been met. And we've been working with MassDOT to uh, leverage the developer to get this done. And they have since signed a contract. It's under design. 25% design was submitted to Mass DOT this week. We're looking for a construction of this signal. This is not a TIP project. This is a separate project. But this signal will start in the fall. And it's critical this gets done ASAP, Mr. Chairman, and, and doesn't hold up anything. This particular signal is the site driveway that serves Moderna, which is based in Norwood, that is uh, providing uh, uh, the vaccines for the uh, for the worldwide uh, pandemic. So uh, we look, like I said, we look forward to both our TIP projects stay on federal fiscal year 22, and uh, look forward to working with Mass DOT uh, district and Boston to get that traffic signal for uh, Moderna site driveway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Next up is Alex Train of Chelsea. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the uh, board. My name is Alex Train. I'm the Director of Housing and Community Development with the City of Chelsea. And I'm here to speak this morning about the Upper Broadway reconstruction project that's currently programmed in federal fiscal year 2022. Um, first, I want to acknowledge and thank the Boston MPO for their investment in equity and environmental justice communities. The Upper Broadway project is the first MPO investment in Chelsea in over five years, and it will advance and accelerate economic, social, and environmental benefits that'll be immensely beneficial to our community and our residents. As many of you know, Chelsea is currently the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of the pandemic and the economic downturn, our fiscal outlook has darkened. Investments in Fed infrastructure uh, through the MPO and other state and federal sources have become that much more integral to our long-term planning, redevelopment, and community enhancement efforts. Our Upper Broadway project consists of the full depth reconstruction of Broadway, a critical principal arterial that runs from City Hall Ave to the Revere City Limit. This main artery will see sidewalk and roadway reconstruction, the modernization of signals, the replacement of obsolete drainage lines, the upgrades of bus stops, and the installation of bike lanes, street trees, and other streetscape features. As we've progressed through the design process, according to our schedule, uh, we've reached the 75% design milestone. As we've been proceeding with the 75% design set, We've encountered cost increases relative to the inflation of mass DOT unit prices that one of my colleagues had previously mentioned. This cost inflation um, has resulted in the project estimate increasing um, by approximately $3.4 million. 
Since we produced that updated estimate, our team has been proactively value engineering the project to shrink that delta down to about 2.1 million. We hope that the board will consider our request for additional funding on this critical project. We are right now proceeding with the design according to schedule with the targeted advertisement date of December of 2021. Preceding this project is a $7 million water and sewer enhancement effort that the city is undertaking with local funding. Combined, these infrastructure investments will be transformative for this artery, yielding economic and community development, environmental benefits, and social benefits um, that vastly outweigh the costs that we have incurred. Thank you for considering our request this morning. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Next up is Christian Guichard, Town of Acton. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen Guichard, Town of Acton Planning Director, um, and I'm here in support of the Kelly's Corner Infrastructure Project. This is Project ID um, 608229. Um, it's programmed in federal fiscal year 22. Um, I'd first like to thank the MPO and MassDOT and MPO staff for their support on this project. The Acton community is extremely excited um, to see this long awaited project become more and more of a reality. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Kelly's Corner, um, it's located between two Route 2 interchanges. Um, it's along Main Street and Massachusetts Avenue in Acton's primary commercial center, also the home of Acton Boxborough um, School Campus. Um, a few project updates. Um, this past spring, town meeting residents voted to appropriate all of the necessary funds to pay for the required acquisitions along the Main Street right of way. Um, the 100% design plans were submitted to MassDOT in January. Uh, they're currently under review. And um, just last week, the project received NEPA approval. Um, so we're very excited about that big milestone. Um, the town we're, is now, we're working on getting our acquisition process moving forward with the property owners um, yeah, along Main Street. Um, and we are aware that there are going to be some slight um, increases above the current tip amount. So the total federal project cost um, increase, I think will be represented in some of the updated TIP documents um, in the next few weeks. So we just wanted to provide that update and thank you once again um, for your support of this project. It's been um, something the community has been looking forward to for several decades. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Next up, Rich Benevinto. Good morning. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to uh, represent uh, six communities this morning that talk about eight projects. Um, two of them are new, so we will wait until, I suppose I can give you a little update on them, but I understand that we'll be waiting until the February 18th meeting to get into new projects. But um, there are um, uh, six projects that are on the, uh, that are currently programmed. Uh, two of them, I guess you'll be talking about in detail, one being Ferry Street, uh, which is uh, listed as over budget. Um, that project, uh, the ps &E has been submitted. Um, the project is scheduled for advertising next month, May 6th, uh, March 6th, excuse me. Um, the estimate, um, the office estimate versus what is actually shown program versus actually what is shown to be overage, just to give you a little update on that. Uh, all of the participating work just based on the office estimate is 24.25 million. Uh, there's a significant amount of uh, non-participating work relative to new water installations and lighting. That's about 6.4 million. Uh, so that brings the uh, the total office estimate to 30.65 million. Um, uh, the project is ready to go. Um, the last thing will be a city council meeting on, on Monday night to accept the right of way. There were 307 easements. The city was successful in securing all of the easements. Uh, so the project is uh, the, the project is uh, is ready to go. Um, Jay Monty, uh, who is a member of the of the MPO board here, uh, can speak to uh, other details if you if you need to. But I just figured I'd give you a quick update on that. Uh, the other project that uh, had a had some red numbers next to it was Peabody Central Street. Um, that project is uh, is advancing. Um, we are scheduled for the design public hearing on May sixth. Uh, with an, an ad date in the first quarter of uh, December 17th, 2022. 
Um, uh, we received mass DOT comments. Uh, as I mentioned, the public hearing is eminent. There was a, uh, an issue with some right away. Um, uh, and so revised right away plans were, uh, were resubmitted um, last week or the week before. Uh, so that project is moving along in earnest as well. Um, again, the office estimate for that is 10 million. 220,000. Uh, there is uh, non-participating work in the amount of 1.9 million for water work. So that actually gets the, um, the total estimate of the project about 12 million, including, uh, again, about uh, 2 million in water work. So um, I know that that will be discussed uh, a little bit later on. Will Pollitz, city engineer from the city of Peabody is on the call today. So if there are other specific questions, uh, we can, uh, you can pose those to Will as well. Um, a couple of other projects that are on, just to give you a quick update where they are, uh, Bridge Street in Beverly, 75% um, uh, is, uh, is underway. Uh, that is in, that's due in May, 75% plan submission. Uh, project is currently estimated at 6.1 million. Um, uh, that pro project is moving along in earnest. Uh, it's in the FY23 uh, federal fiscal year, scheduled to be advertised on December 3rd of 22. Uh, no glaring issues on that project. It's moving uh, along uh, in earnest um, and uh, plenty of support from the city. Darlene Wynn, who's also on the board here, uh, is also can also provide some additional comment if necessary. Uh, city of Lynn, um, a rep, uh, rehabilitation of Essex Street. Um, that project is advancing. We're in uh, the 25% design phase. It's uh, in, scheduled in FY24 with an ad date of 224-24. Um, the project is currently estimated at about 16.9 million. Obviously, as we advance through the preliminary design and get into final design, these numbers uh, will all be refined as we get uh, more into the details of the project. Um, but that project is also moving in earnest, very important to the city of Lynn, uh, as you might imagine. Um, another project uh, that's underway is um, uh, Everett Street, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Beecham Street in Everett. Uh, this is actually a pretty important project given that Chelsea has also uh, engaged in uh, the reconstruction of uh, Beecham Street on their end. Uh, projects uh, scheduled um, uh, for the uh, FY25 fiscal year. Uh, it's currently programmed for 7 million. Uh, and we are, uh, as I mentioned, we're in the 25% uh, design phase of that project. Uh, and then we have um, Woburn Center. Uh, scheduled in FY25, currently programmed for 14.3 million. Uh, Tina Cassidy is on the, uh, on the board here, so she can provide some additional update to that as well. And I think that is everything, Mr. Chairman. Two other new projects that will be coming up that are un actually underway, and that is Brookline, uh, Washington Street in Brookline. Todd Coran, who's on the, uh, on the board here, can, can uh, provide some additional update to that. The survey is underway, the topographic survey. Uh, we're hoping that project uh, will be considered by the MPO for programming, uh, presumably in FY26. Uh, and then also Lynn Western Ave, um, which is uh, uh, also uh, underway. Um, and it's uh, um, hopefully uh, it was in the uh, LRTP, uh, given the new uh, uh, cap limits, uh, that project will be considered for complete streets, hopefully as well, that project is underway. Uh, survey is uh, uh, being wrapped up, topographic survey, traffic studies, et cetera, and uh, community outreach and meetings are underway as well. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Rich. Next up is Alita Lisa. Can you unmute her, please? Oh, thank there you. Go. Good morning and thank you. Yeah, I was saying that I am an abutter um, and I like uh, uh, Professor uh, Jessica Whited, uh, she lives down the street from me. Um, I'm talking to you because you will be reviewing the community path project that Belmont is submitting and they plan to submit the 25% design supposedly in March. Uh, the town, I would like to inform you that this is really not a community project. The abutters, which is uh, quite about 70 uh, homes, have been consistently uh, uh, stonewall and kept out. Uh, emails, voicemails, asking questions are not answered. Uh, the meetings are posted at the very last minute, uh, which is uh, by law is 48 hours. Uh, uh, people that are the 
the abutters are not allowed to ask questions and uh, uh, but while those that are, that are known to be um, pro this park um, are allowed to ask questions. Um, uh, engineer Michael Trepanier went, came to one meeting uh, and he can uh, attest to the truth of what I'm saying. He witnesses how, how I was told that I could not ask a question and a pro park person then later was allowed to actually participate in the discussion. Um, the public, so-called public engagement that we had uh, was pitiful. Uh, they presented engineering plans that were two and a half by three inches. Fortunately, my husband, who's a computer programmer, was able to pull those engineering plans and so that we could actually read them. And we passed them on to uh, other abutters. Uh, but they were engineering plans. They were never explained. I had to sit down and fortunately, I'm a scientist and started learning about engineering symbols to try to decipher it. Um, and the same thing has been happening recently at the meetings. We have opposed lights, we have drainage issues. I actually have learned quite a bit about roadside drainage and what they have proposed to deal with the fact that our properties, many of them are about 10 to 12 feet below the level of this proposed park. So we will be receiving the water. They have proposed what is a, uh, your typical roadway um, perforated pipe that just uh, receives water from the park, but we'll go ahead and proceed to leach it down to us. Uh, that is the only purpose of it, to try to keep your park or the park that they're planning to build uh, free of um, ice and rain while it will be delivered to us. Uh, they have not, a, they just completely ignore us in on the, this, uh, this drainage issue, the light issue, um, the fact that uh, they will, uh, they're the salt because it will have to keep um, salting this park because they want it open 24 seven. And that salt will also then land in our yards and it will kill my trees. I have about 17 of them, which I protect by spending thousands of dollars on those trees every year. I really resent and protest considering our climate crisis that those trees will be at risk. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting very, so anyways, thank you. I should probably quit here and let you know that I will be sending more detailed comments to Mr. Genova because um, to be honest, I'm too nervous. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. Next up is Jeanette Rebecca. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeanette Rebecca. I'm with the town of Bedford DPW. Um, I'm here today to talk about the Minuteman Bikeway Extension Project, which is one of the projects on the list that has had a cost increase since last year. Um, the town of Bedford has been working for the past 15 years, diligently planning and designing this regionally significant project, which extends the Minuteman Bikeway from Bedford Center to the Concord Town Line. 75% um, designs were submitted this past fall, and a good portion of the cost increase highlighted today comes from the further design and development of the culvert under Route 62, which is a high speed, high volume roadway, uh, and the replacement of a 16 inch water main along the off road portion of the path, which needed to be lowered so the side slopes would not impact the surrounding wetlands. We do not expect the price to continue to increase at this point. We're thrilled to be closing in on our construction date and we're actively working to secure the right of way. The project is currently on schedule and could even be accelerated to meet an earlier 2022 advertisement date. I'm happy to answer any of your additional questions as we move on to later agenda items. We also have our project designer, Josh Triarchus from VHB on the call if you need any further details. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubicki. Next up, Robert Pinfield. Good morning, David and all. Uh, my name is Bob Penfield. I'm a consultant uh, with VHB, I'm speaking on behalf of the city of Woburn uh, regarding the new Boston Street Bridge Replacement Project. I uh, just wanted to reemphasize uh, the city's um, consideration of how important this project is as a regional transportation connection uh, for a portion of the city that has, um, as long as uh, in the past, not have a uh, traffic and um, multimodal connection to uh, with between it and uh, neighboring towns. 
Uh, we are currently on uh, a revised schedule, looking to have the PSNE submittal go in April of this year with an anticipated project advertisement for May of this year. Uh, so we are very close to the end. Um, but I wanted to spend a few minutes discussing some of the, uh, the cost increases that have come in between the 75% submittal and the 100% submittal uh, just earlier um, in, in August of 2020. So we have um, incurred approximately uh, between the engineer's estimate between 75 and 100, uh, the cost increase has uh, come in at around $3 million uh, for this um, approximately $20 million project. And this is primarily uh, because of two reasons. One, uh, per coordination with MassDOT and, and direction um, and coordination with utility owners, there is um, a need to in, uh, move all of the utilities, the proposed utilities underground and uh, moving them to an underground location uh, involves significant infrastructure and that is uh, estimated to cost approximately $2 million. Uh, second uh, reason for the increase is uh, through some coordination with EPA, which uh, has a, which our project abuts. Um, they have requested some assumptions, changes to assumptions as far as soil management, and that has um, resulted in another increase of approximately $1 million. We do not anticipate any cost increase beyond this point now, um, and we expect to have an updated estimate reflecting that um, again in April of this year. Um, with me is uh, Jay Corey, city engineer for the city of Woburn. Um, if there was any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Pinfield. Welcome. Richmond and Video, you have your hand back up. Is that on purpose? Yes, it is. I forgot one. Sorry. No worries. Richard Benevento from World Tech Engineering. Uh, um, one, one other update uh, was Watertown, uh, Mount Auburn Street, a uh, pretty significant project uh, for the town. Uh, it, the 25% submission was uh, sent in uh, oh, about a year ago. Uh, there's been some, uh, uh, some coordination with the MBTA. As you may know, there's catenary wires along Mount Auburn Street, and there's been a lot of discussion as to whether the catenary wires go away and we go to electric buses. And so there's been a lot of discussion recently with the MBTA. Um, we're expecting to get final comments from them, uh, hopefully next week um, and with the public hearing uh, being scheduled uh, early spring. So within the next couple of months, we'd be having the public hearing uh, on that project. Project is currently programmed for 27.25 million. Um, we don't see any problem with the ad date right now, which is February of uh, uh, 24. It's on the 23 tip, I believe. Um, tw excuse me, 22 tip. So it's uh, February 24th of 23. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're moving in earnest on that project as well. Uh, Greg St. Louis, the public works superintendent from Watertown is on the phone, uh, on the call as well this morning. Um, if you have any additional questions, but I had forgot that one, Dave. So I just wanted to make sure it uh, got on the record that uh, we have a, we have a progress moving on that project as well. Thank you. So next item on the end, to everybody who spoke, please do stay on the line in case we, we have questions during Matt's presentation. Uh, next item on the agenda is committee chairs reports. Are there any? Ben Nelson, uh, Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Ben Muller with MassDOT Office of Transportation Planning and the chair of the UPWP committee. Um, just want to give you a heads up. We met this morning with the UPWP committee to kick off the development of the 2022 UPWP. There's some good discussion about the timelines and about changes to the document that we anticipate. Um, we also agreed to post our meetings onto YouTube. So if you can't attend our meetings at any point, you can always go watch them. Um, so if you want to see that this cycle, I encourage you to check that out. And the reinforce the executive director's note uh, and her report. If you have any study ideas for the MPO, please fill out the survey that's on the MPO website and it's linked in the chat or send them along to Sandy Just Johnson. Uh, we're aiming to close that up by February 12th. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Any questions for Ben? Seeing none. Next item on the agenda is the Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have not had a meeting since our last meeting, but I'll just give you um, some, uh, let you know what's coming up. Uh, so at our next meeting, we're going to have um, Marty Okovitz from uh, from our staff. He talk to us about modeling. It'll pretty much be uh, modeling 101, but he'll also hopefully give us some insights as to how that modeling, uh, the modeling process is going to fit into uh, what I think is going to be um, scenario, some scenario planning that we are going to um, do in this next um, LRTP. And um, um, on behalf of the Rider Oversight Committee, you know, I want to let you know that uh, Mr. Hicks, Mr. Ryan Hicks from uh, CTPS is going to come and talk with us about um, his memorandum that he presented to our, um, the MPO's um, uh, congestion management committee. Uh, it was on the inventory of park and ride lots at the MBTA facilities and no that may not sound exciting but but uh, he had some interesting data on the utilization of those lots you know, and a dashboard that they are creating. So I invite you all uh, to come to that meeting um, if you have if you want. Uh, uh, I think it'll be a really interesting topic. You'll get to see how the one of the subcommittees, the capital investment and um, finance subcommittee of the Rider Oversight Committee um, functions. And I just want to add, um, finally, that um, I got to participate in that Transit Equity Task Force meeting uh, uh, yesterday, you know, uh, 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 the day before, uh, uh, with um, uh, Betsy Harvey was leading it, and it was really well done. Ian, and, and once again, I'm, I'm really so happy with what the MPO um, is doing with respect to transit equity. And uh, we just constantly move forward or try to move forward on that. So I appreciate, express my appreciation for that. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Any questions for Lynn? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of January 7th. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the minutes and please state your name for the record? Tina Cassidy. Yes, good morning. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Brian Kane. Second. That motion has been made and seconded. Any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I have uh, one from Daniel Amsterdam who had to leave. Um, he mentions on page five under members items that uh, Mr. Miller made a comment about the COVID-19 relief package. Uh, the minutes say that $1.4 trillion in annual appropriations for transportation uh, and an additional $10 billion uh, will be uh, allocated through state DOTs. Uh, we will change those minutes to read that the total package should be $1.4 trillion, not $1.4 trillion in annual appropriations for transportation. Thank you. And Ken Miller has, has his hand raised also. Ken? Well, uh, thank you. That was my comment, too. It was one, it's $1.4 trillion in total, not, not for transportation. Thank you, Ken. So with those changes, can uh, please call the roll. Okay, David Moeller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Samantha Silverberg. Yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins. Uh, we'll come back to Leonard. Uh, Tom Kadzis. Yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Uh, Daniel Impstutz has left the meeting. Uh, Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Austin Saganowitz. Austin 
Austin Saganowitz abstains. Thatcher Keezer. Thatcher Keezer votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Uh, somebody unmute Darlene. I think she may be having a connection issue at the moment, so maybe circle back. Okay, I'll circle back. Uh, Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy, yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier abstain. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Okay, and I'll just circle back to uh, Leonard Diggins. Sorry about that. I mean, I, I thought I'd said yes, I and mean, you'd heard me, but apparently not. That's Okay, thanks, Leonard. We'll get we have a yes now. <laughs> uh, and Darlene Wynn. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear you now? Okay, all right, thanks. Sorry. Um, yes, Darlene yes. Wynn, yes. Okay. Uh, motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. The next item on the agenda is an action item to approve the 2021 roadway safety targets. Michelle Scott's going to give the presentation and then we will take questions after her presentation. Ready when you are, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a member of MPO staff and I'll be talking about roadway safety performance targets today. Next slide, please. So there are three main messages I'm hoping you'll take away from today's presentation. Um, the first is that states and MPOs are required to set annual targets for federally required safety performance measures. I'm going to explain those targets today and our recommendation as staff is that you support the Commonwealth's calendar year 2021 targets for these federally required measures. The opportunity that comes out of this um, target setting process is that you have an opportunity to review recent, recent safety trends and use that information to, just, to excuse me, support discussions about improving safety through capital investment or other means. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the presentation. Um, first, touch briefly on the MPO's broader performance-based planning and programming process. I'll give an overview of the roadway safety performance measures. Um, describe the Commonwealth's calendar year 21 target setting process. Um, go over the roadway safety trends and targets in some more detail. Um, discuss briefly opportunities to improve safety and performance, and then move on to questions and the requested action for today. There is a memo on the MPO meeting calendar that accompanies this presentation, and I'll give some feedback about how to follow along in that document as we proceed. Next slide, please. So here's just a quick schedule of um, performance-based planning and programming activities for the first part of this calendar year. The last meeting, uh, the MPO reviewed and voted on targets for related to transit asset management. Today, we're talking about targets pertaining to roadway safety. And next month, we'll be talking about transit safety performance and targets in that area. Next slide, please. Um, so as you may remember from last time, as part of the TAM presentation, um, there are four main federal performance areas that affect um, federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. These include safety, asset condition, system performance, and congestion and air quality. And we'll be focusing on that first area, safety, particularly roadway safety. Next slide, please. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about the MPO's performance-based planning and programming process, a great resource is our current Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, that covers federal fiscal years 21 through 25. Um, chapter four, the performance analysis chapter, has a lot of, of detail on the MPO's process and targets. 
To learn more about the Commonwealth's performance management process, you can review their tracker report at mass.tracker.com. Next slide, please. So here's some general information about these federally required roadway safety performance measures. There are five of them as shown on the slide. Um, first, number of fatalities, rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled or VMT, number of serious injuries, rate of serious injuries per 100 million VMT, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. Some details that they have in common, they're all outcome-based measures. They reflect fatalities and injuries specifically for motor vehicle collisions. Uh, those are collisions happening on any public road, regardless of that road's jurisdiction or ownership. These measures are expressed as five-year rolling annual averages, and they reflect one calendar year. So last year's targets were an average for 2016 through 2020. This year's targets will be an average for 2017 through 2021. And the goal with all these measures is to minimize their value, bring it cl as close to zero as we possibly can. Next slide, please. So according to federal requirements, the target setting process um, goes like this as outlined uh, in the diagram on the slide. Um, USDOT first establishes a performance measure for roadway safety through federal rulemaking. Then states set targets for that measure, a target for that measure for each calendar year in the Commonwealth, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security or EOPS work on this process together. Within 180 days, then MPOs choose to either support the state target or set a separate target for the MPO area for that measure. For that first option, um, no quantifiable target is needed for the MPO area. The MPO is effectively agreeing to plan and program projects to help the state reach that statewide roadway safety target. And we work with MassDOT on setting target narratives for our long range transportation plan and our TIP. This is the option that the MPO has chosen for the last several years. In option two, setting a separate target for the MPO area would require the MPO to establish a quantified target and explain its methodology, including for component metrics such as vehicle miles traveled. We'd still be coordinating with MassDOT on this process. And again, we report our targets to MassDOT and in the LRTP and TIP. Uh, technically, the uh, MPO could choose a different approach for each measure. In past years, the MPO has chosen the same approach for setting targets for all measures. Next slide, please. As data becomes available, um, FHWA or the Federal Highway Administration evaluates the progress that states have made towards achieving their targets. And this slide, which is on table two in the memo on page four, um, describes a recent evaluation that uh, FHWA conducted for Massachusetts calendar year 2018 targets. And what FHWA is looking for is whether states are making what is termed significant process towards their targets. This means that for four out of the five roadway safety measures, um, state performance either achieves the target or is at least better than baseline. And so as shown on this slide, for their calendar, 18, uh, calendar year 18 targets, um, Massachusetts does achieve significant progress, which is great news. Um, should a state not achieve significant process, FHWA has the ability to limit the flexibility in the way that state spends their highway safety dollars to direct more funding towards initiatives to approve safety outcomes. Um, FHWA follows a different process for evaluating MPOs. Ours is a more process oriented type of evaluation in which FHWA looks at how MPOs are incorporating performance based planning and programming principles in our decision-making process as part of our quadrennial certification review. Next slide, please. So when setting targets, and particularly this year, the Commonwealth takes a, into account a number of different factors. Uh, first is historic data, uh, looking back at past trends um, and the impact dashboard for which the logo is shown on the slide is a great resource and a publicly available one to explore roadway safety data. Um, as part of this look back, um, states can often update safety data to phase in new requirements for that data or to make data um, more comprehensive. 
For example, this year, um, MassDOT and EOPS brought in more data about non-motorized users uh, going on beyond just people who walk and people who bike to account those who use mobility devices and other means of non-motorized travel. The second area, current trends, um, and of course, the trend affecting last year and this year is the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on travel behavior, particularly uh, decreases in VMT which happened in 2020 and are likely to continue into 2021. And so the images on the slide both emphasize the importance of public health in terms of people staying at home and traveling less. And that photo beneath kind of captures some of the shared streets projects um, that came up as uh, roadway uh, vehicle use of roadways decreased. Finally, there's policies and strategies that move uh, the Commonwealth in the right direction for safety performance. Um, these are captured in the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, but Massachusetts modal plans, including the bicycle and pedestrian plans, capture those strategies as well. Next slide, please. So in general, the Commonwealth followed this um, broad process when setting its targets. Um, it set calendar year 21 targets that were either lower than calendar year 20 targets or lower than recent estimates or projections. So this approach accounted for um, projections of VMT for calendar years 20 and 21. Um, through this process, the Commonwealth identified reasonable but desirable annual percent decreases in fatalities or serious injuries and historic and draft data and these projections were used to create the target averages. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the Commonwealth's um, targets, um, both for calendar year 2021 as federally required and the Commonwealth's long-term targets for these measures. This information is on table three in the memo, which is on page six. So the calendar year 2021 targets are 339 for the number of fatalities, 0 0.55 for the rate of fatalities per 100 million VMT, 2,580 for the number of serious injuries, 4.23 for the rate of serious injuries per 100 million VMT, and 506 for the number of non-motorized non fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. And so this process um, used the guidance that comes from FHWA, which is to set targets that are data-driven, realistic, and attainable. However, the Commonwealth has complementary targets for these measures for the long term, which is to bring all of these values to zero. Next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly go over some recent trends um, as shown as in a series of charts. Um, this first one pertaining to the number of fatalities is in figure one on page seven of the memo. Um, to go over the basic format, green bars show data for the Commonwealth. The darkest bars reflect actual data. Lighter green to the left of that dotted line reflects draft data. Um, on the right side of that dotted line uh, is the projection for 2020 and the target for 2021. The chart also shows in blue data for the Boston MPO region. The darker bars reflect actual data and the lighter bars show draft data. Uh, again, this is presented in five-year rolling annual averages. Um, in 2016, uh, there was a spike in fatalities, both nationwide and within the Commonwealth that pushed that average up, but it, that average has been declining in recent years, both at the Commonwealth and Boston region scale. Next slide, please. This diagram shows the fatality rate. Um, again, Commonwealth information presented in green with the closed circles reflecting actual data. Um, open circles reflecting draft data, the open triangle reflecting a projection for the 2020 average and the closed triangle reflecting the target. And again, information for the MPO region is presented in blue. Um, in general, the fatality rate has been lower in the Boston region than for the Commonwealth overall, but again, both have been decreasing somewhat in recent years. Next slide, please. This shows the number of serious injuries. This is shown in figure three on page nine of the memo and follows the same color scheme as the number of fatalities as shown um, on that chart there. Um, again, you can see that both the Commonwealth's and the Boston region's average number of serious injuries has been declining over time. Next slide, please. Um, here we have the serious injury rate um, for the Commonwealth in the Boston region uh, following uh, the same color uh, format scheme as for fatality rate. 
Um, you can see that the Boston region um, and the Commonwealth's serious injury rate values are, are more similar than for fatalities, but again, both decreasing over time. Next slide, please. Finally, we have the number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. Um, there had been an upward or undesirable trend in that area up until uh, 2016, and that trend has generally reversed for the Commonwealth in recent years. One thing that's notable here is that you can see on average for the Boston region, we make up a larger share of the non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized uh, serious injuries in the Commonwealth than the Boston region makes up of either fatalities on the whole or serious injuries on the whole, which highlights this as an area of emphasis that we'll wanna be looking at going forward. Next slide, please. So this slide kind of highlights some of the strategies involved in improving transportation safety, building a little bit off of the discussion had at the last MPO meeting where Sandy Johnson and Paul Christner uh, presented on Vision Zero research. So these include things like policy and legislation, adjusting speed limits or uh, instituting hands-free driving laws, collecting and analyzing data, um, engineering to improve roadway safety and make infrastructure investment, uh, supporting education and awareness campaigns, and supporting emergency response. So the main areas where the MPO is most active is related to that data and analysis portion and through engineering and infrastructure. So to just make some general connections back to that Vision Zero content from last meeting, um, they emphasize the importance of roadway design as a key method of improving roadway safety, putting the onus of reducing fatality, fatalities and serious injuries on roadway designers and owners as opposed to individual people using those facilities. And that in general emphasizes the value and the importance of the MPO's role in making capital investments to improve safety through roadway design and improvement. The other piece is the importance of coordination between different levels of government to achieve better safety outcomes. Um, the MPO operates in two of these areas. MassDOT and the region's municipalities can use some of these other levers in different ways. And so we can achieve the best outcome by working together. Next slide, please. So in terms of opportunities that come out of reviewing roadway safety performance and going through the target setting process, um, it's probably most particularly useful for TIP discussions. Um, we're looking at recent trends in safety performance. And then coming up in the subsequent meetings, we're gonna be looking at candidate regional target projects and thinking about how they can address safety needs based on their features and evaluating scores. Then when MassDOT um, brings their programming for the upcoming TIP, for MPO consideration, it's an opportunity to consider roadway safety in that context as well. This information can also be a jumping off point for municipal exchanges about how you all improve roadway safety in your communities and the lessons you've learned for that process. And for future MPO discussions, this information can be a springboard for talking about complementary target setting. Matt, if you could jump ahead to the requested action slide, which I think is two slides ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so again, to bring it back to the points I made at the beginning, today MPO staff request that the MPO move to support the Commonwealth set of calendar year 2020, 2021 federally required roadway safety targets. Uh, we recommend this approach both to satisfy federal requirements and also to reflect the collaborative relationships um, and partnerships necessary to improve roadway safety in the region. The deadline for this is February 27th, the end of this month. And should you um, take this action today, the MPO's next step will be to support your future roadway safety discussions and incorporate information on updated targets and information on how planned investments affect roadway safety performance measures into the upcoming tip for federal fiscal years 22 through 26. Next slide, please. I'm gonna bring back up the um, slide showing the targets and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Very well done. Thank you. Question for the MPO? Brian King. I was going to move to accept. Excellent. Are there any questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve as presented today? Oh, wait. I think Ken Miller has a question. Ken, do you have a question? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to echo what you said. It was an excellent presentation, Michelle. Thank you very much. Uh, one is to, um, I see that the state uh, has, um, uh, for its fatality uh, uh, rate, has chosen to uh, continue with, uh, a downward trend. I should caution uh, those that uh, fatalities are staying about the same. Uh, but because uh, for uh, because of the pandemic, uh, traffic though uh, traffic volumes have decreased, so that means if uh, the rates will be going up, perhaps uh, uh, we hope you know one year or two years worth. So that's something just to keep in mind as we're setting these rates. And uh, and secondly, in terms of things that can be done, uh, David, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think uh, the legislature is still is considering uh, again. A primary seatbelt law, Massachusetts has, has one of the lowest seatbelt usage rates in the country. Uh, there's a direct correlation between uh, primary seatbelt laws and seatbelt usage. And so uh, I would encourage everybody to encourage their state legislators to support a primary seatbelt law. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Brian, you want to make your motion to accept as presented? Let me, Brian Kane, please. Move to accept as presented. Thank you. Lynn? I'll second, and, and then can I ask a question, maybe make a comment? Go ahead and ask your question or make your comment before we vote. Sure. So I really appreciate what Ken said. The first part I was curious about too, because I heard that that um, uh, people were driving more dangerously and, uh, and speeding more, and that we were seeing an increase in fatalities. And so with the VMTs going down, it did strike me that we probably see an increase in the rate. Uh, the second, um, the, the I guess my question is uh, around the state highway. Another, Lynn, Lynn, you, 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 we, we lost you for a minute. You, you, we heard your comment about the uh, rate, but then you said your second question, and we lost your volume for a second. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, you know, I have, I've got no unstable internet, and I'm at work. I, mean, it's just, I, I just didn't want to miss your point, Lynn. So go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, um, so, um, see, I'm trying to remember now. Um, so, uh, the state highway safety plan. You know, um, has there been any presentation? about that to the, the MPO or some way that we can get a sense of, of what that entails? Uh, yeah, we can We can either schedule a presentation for the MPO or we could possibly talk about having a presentation for our tech or we could also just figure out a way to, to do it without having a presentation. So so why don't you, what, what, you know, I will talk to, um, people who do the state highway safety plan and I'll talk to the NPO staff and we'll figure out where it's appropriate to um, schedule it in during the tip process because tip process is going to take up a lot of our meetings for a while. Yeah it doesn't have to be for for this cycle you know uh, but something I think uh, to really get a good handle on and understand how the state is doing things and how the NPO can work better with them. Thank you. Thank you Lynn. Um, Mr. Chair I can respond to his first question unless uh, OTP staff would like to respond. Go well, ahead, yeah, to Lynn's point of, and Kin's point about fatality rates. Um, yes, it is certainly true that fatality rates may rise during the COVID period because people are speeding and people are driving um, less, perhaps less safely than they had prior to COVID. Uh, but this is a target and we did not want to have a target of increasing the fatality rate. So we may indeed fail this target depending on what the trends end up being from COVID. But if we fail it, we'll have an explanation of why we failed it. We just didn't want to set a target that said, our target is more people per mile will, will die than they did in the last year. So motion having been made in second, can we please call the roll? David Moeller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Samantha Silverberg. Yes. Eric Barrasso. Yes. Brian Kane. <coughs> yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Tom Kadzis. Yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Yes. 
Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Austin Saganowitz. Austin Saganowitz, yes. Patrick Keezer. Patrick Keezer votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy votes yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. The next thing on our agenda is a discussion of the Transportation Improvement Program Project and Funding Overview for 2022 to 2026. Matt Genova. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm here to kick off the programming conversations for the federal fiscal years 2022 through 2026 Transportation Improvement Program. This will be the first of several conversations on the TIP over the next few months. And we'll begin today with an overview of the funding picture for this year's TIP and the projects that are being considered for that funding. Uh, here's the ground that we'll cover during today's presentation. Uh, I'll start with a quick reminder of where we are on this year's TIP development timeline, and we'll then briefly introduce the new projects being considered for TIP funding this year. From there, we'll dive into the main portion of the presentation, which is a summary of the funding outlook for the federal fiscal years 2022 through 26 TIP. In closing, I'll touch on a handful of next steps before opening things up for a discussion. So beginning with the timeline for this year's TIP process, Right now, we're about halfway through developing the new TIP. Over the last few months, we've reached out to cities and towns in the region to understand what their needs are for project funding. We then presented a list of those projects to this board back in November in the form of the TIP project universe. Over the last six weeks or so, we've conducted project scoring for those projects that are ready to pursue funding this cycle, and project proponents are now reviewing those draft scores to make sure that they're accurate. As I mentioned earlier, we'll spend the next several weeks developing a new five-year funding plan, which will be released for public comment in late April and endorsed by this board in late May. Uh, so I wanna briefly go into a little bit more detail on what's happened behind the scenes since we last discussed the project universe back in November. So since November, a number of key st steps in the TIP process have been completed. First, MPO staff spent the latter part of the fall collecting information on projects that wanted to be considered for funding this year. We used a number of data sets from our partners at MassDOT, including data on safety, as you just heard about, um, roadway pavement condition, and bridge condition, among other things. We also gather a significant amount of information directly from project proponents. We have proponents fill out a questionnaire that includes a lot of the information that we use to score projects. And then proponents also submit documentation on their projects to us, including project plans, functional design reports, road safety audit reports, and more. In early December, uh, we at, at that time, we're also continuing our conversations with our counterparts at MassDOT's highway district offices, as well as with project proponents to make sure that projects are ready to be considered for funding and that they've been approved by MassDOT's project review committee or that they have a plan to be approved prior to form being formally considered for programming. In cases where proponents submit multiple alternative designs to us, we also work with them to understand which alternative is the preferred one, which will then score. So you'll hear this a lot from me probably over the next couple of months, uh, but the TIP process is very much a team effort and project scoring is certainly no exception to that. A number of staff members at both CTPS and MAPC lend their skills and expertise to this work. So at this point, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of them for their help, uh, including Betsy Harvey, Matt Archer, Kathy Jacob, Ryan Hicks, Bill Kuttner, Casey Claude, Margaret Atkinson, Lily Perkins High, and Caitlin Spence. 
Once scoring is complete, we do an internal quality check to make sure everything looks good. And then we send the draft scores out to project proponents for their review. Proponent feedback is critical as we wanna make sure that we're scoring projects accurately and fairly. After making any necessary edits to the scores based on that feedback, we then share those scores with this board, which will happen at the next MPO meeting on February 18th. So now that you know a little bit more about how we get to this point, uh, I'd like to offer a brief preview of the projects that we scored this year. So in total, we scored 27 projects, 16 of which are being scored for the first time. The other 11 projects were scored last year, but not funded due to funding limitations. And so those projects will likely look familiar to you all as we discuss them at the next board meeting. These 27 projects uh, are distributed across five of the MPO's investment programs, including 13 community connections projects, eight complete streets projects, and then two projects apiece for intersection improvements, bicycle network and pedestrian connections, and major infrastructure. If you're interested in seeing a full list of projects that have been evaluated this year, uh, there's a handout posted to the MPO meeting calendar that has this information available in table one, which is on pages one and two of that handout. As is the case every TIP cycle, these projects will primarily be considered for funding in the fifth and final year of the TIP, which is federal fiscal year 2026, as the first four years of the TIP are more or less fully programmed from prior TIP cycles, a subject which we'll come back to here shortly. So when considering TIP projects for funding, one of the many tools used by this board is the relationship between the current distribution of MPO funds across project types compared to the goals that were set for this funding distribution in the MPO's long range transportation plan. Shown here is our starting point for this year, which is the current distribution of funds in the fiscal years 2021 through 2025 TIP. As you can see, we're slightly over-programmed on complete streets and major infrastructure, and slightly under-programmed on intersection improvements and transit modernization. Some of this is due to the changing definition of major infrastructure, which we discussed at several MPO meetings last fall, uh, and what's shown here is the distribution of funding using the, current, the MPO's current definition rather than the definition that was used at the time of original project programming. Uh, one other note here is that uh, because it was a new investment program as of last year, there's only one year of funding in the current TIP for transit modernization. As that program continues to roll out in the coming years, the discrepancy here between the goal and the actual funding level will continue to decrease. So now that you know how we got to today and have a sense of the projects that will be considered for funding this year, I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation walking you through how much funding we'll have available this year with which to make new investment decisions. Beginning with an overview of our five-year funding picture, depicted in blue is our anticipated funding in each fiscal year, which is the amount we plan for when allocating funding to projects. These numbers are determined by a variety of factors, including guidance from the Federal Highway Administration, as well as our partners at MassDOT. MPO staff receive this information every January at the Massachusetts Association of Regional Planning Agencies, or MARPA, annual meeting. Depicted here in orange is the difference between our currently anticipated available funding and the amount of funding that we projected we would have available in each year when completing the most recent long-range transportation plan in 2019. You'll notice that our available funding in 2025, which was programmed in last year's TIP, was roughly $4.3 million below what was anticipated in the long-range plan. That discrepancy increases further to nearly $9 million in fiscal 2026, which will be the fifth and final year of this year's TIP. We can go into, fur uh, into further detail if there are questions on this later, uh, but the key takeaway here is that this board will have just over $105 million to allocate to projects in 2026, which is lower than anticipated in the long range plan and also lower than any of the prior four years. So what are some of our limitations and how we spend this new funding in 2026? Uh, first, past practice by this board has been to retain some funding in support of two of the MPO's investment programs, community connections and transit modernization to allocate to new projects in future TIP cycles as those fiscal years approach. This board also has an established commitment to the reconstruction of Rutherford Avenue in Boston 
an LRTP project that is current that currently has funding allocated to it in fiscal years 2022 through 2025. When we finished TIP programming discussions last spring, it was anticipated that a fifth and final year of funding for this project would be allocated in 2026. And finally, this should come as no surprise to you, uh, given many of the comments we heard earlier in today's meeting. Uh, and I wish I had better news on this front, but much like last year, there have been a number of cost increases for projects that are currently programmed in the TIP in federal fiscal years 2021 through 2025. These changes are broken out by project in table two of the same handout that I referenced earlier. I'll note briefly that the scale of cost increases at $69 million is similar to last year's total, which was roughly $74 million. So what does all this mean for this year's TIP? Our first priority will be to ensure that a solution is found for the fiscal year 2021 projects, as these projects are all due to advertise for bids before September 30th of this year. Just as last year, these changes will be made through a TIP amendment that will move forward alongside our programming discussions in the coming weeks. Because the TIP is a fiscally constrained capital plan, any changes made in fiscal year 2021 will filter through the entire five-year plan, necessitating further changes in each year. So I'm gonna briefly summarize how this picture looks broken out by fiscal year. Across all five years of the current TIP, just $1.2 million remains unallocated, meaning there's essentially no wiggle room to accommodate cost increases in any fiscal year. Across the bottom row of this table, you can see our current status in each fiscal year. After all cost increases are incorporated, years 21 through 25 each show a deficit, while 2026, our new fifth year of this coming TIP, shows a surplus. All the way in the bottom right hand cell on this table, you can see what this looks like when all available funds and cost increases are added together, leaving us with just shy of $36 million on net over six years. Unfortunately, however, this $36 million does not yet take into account the existing obligations that I mentioned earlier. So we carry that number forward from our last slide. And then we add in the existing obligations for community connections, transit modernization, and the balance of funding for the reconstruction of Rutherford Avenue. We end up with a final tally of $3.3 million to allocate to new projects this year. To put that number into perspective, the total cost of projects buying for funding this year is nearly $294 million. All of that leads to our big question for today and really for the next several weeks which is how does this board want to approach this challenge to arrive at a new five-year capital program? Before we discuss that question, I'll briefly highlight where we're heading in the coming weeks. At the next MPO meeting on February 18th, we'll go into more detail on the new projects seeking funding this year. In early March, we'll provide this board with a readiness update on all currently programmed projects, which will provide some additional information to work with as we discuss a range of scenarios for the final TIP program throughout the rest of the month of March. And with that, I will turn it back over to the chair for questions and a discussion. Thank you, Matt. Questions from the members? Lynn Biggins. This is really depressing, Matt. This is really depressing, you know, because I guess the question now is, I mean, that we're going to likely see more, more, um, cost overruns. So I, I think the big question for us is, what do we do I mean, when we see more overruns mean and and we don't have the money to allocate me we we, we, we I, I think we don't even think about programming anything else at this point but just prepare ourselves for what happens if we get more cost overruns and i guess that's a question I mean, is what what would we, what would we do what will we do that is a great question <laughs> i will leave that up to this board to uh to discuss that further Others? Eric Barasa. Thanks, Matt. That's a good overview. Uh, I'm wondering if, you know, I know we got a little bit of an update during the public comment from a number of project proponents on the cost overruns. It seemed that there were some things related to mass dot estimates of materials. But Matt, do you have a sense, and maybe, um, I don't know if John um, 
Bashard or any others could talk about some of the big projects that have gone up in cost? Like what are the things that are that are really driving that? Matt, can you put up on the, I, I know that, that somewhere on the website is some memo with, with the cost overruns on it. Is, do you have access to it so you can put it up? Because because if, if we're going if we're going to discuss individual projects, and I think we should, we need to have some frame of reference of what we're talking about. Yeah, I think we can probably do that, um, Matt Archer. I don't know, I don't know if that's a, if we can do a quick uh, screen switch on um, on that. Um, yeah, so maybe just give us a second to yeah to pull that up. Right. I'll so, take, it'll take me just a few, but I can uh, work on that. Okay, because seems to, to, Eric's, <laughs> to Eric's point, most of this issue is cost overruns as of right now, right? And and in, in I think Matt had a slide that said in 20, uh, 2021, the current year, we're already $11 million out of constraint. We have to figure out what we're going to do to meet that constraint by either delaying projects, deleting projects, or finding money somewhere, right? So that $11 million, I believe, is made up of, I think Matt said, six projects, of which I think the two biggest drivers are the Ferry Street project, in Ever uh, is it Ferry Street? Whatever, the, Ever the Everett project and the New Boston Street Bridge project. So while Matt Archer is trying to find that, that chart, John Bashar, do you have any updates on either of those projects you'd like to talk about? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we are, you know, we're, we're aware of the cost increases and we are working actively with the uh, designer and my team to, uh, you know, to bring closure to some of those cost increases uh, from uh, the two biggest ones, as you had referenced, were Everett Ferry Street and New Boston Street in Woburn. The um, Everett Street, uh, excuse me, Ferry Street in Everett is uh, essentially, you know, PS&E 100% complete. And I think was shared by Mr. Benevento on behalf of the uh, city of Everett. Um, the, there's approximately $6 million in non-participating work for street lighting and some landscape design details, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's one of the items that's contributing to the significant uh, cost increase. And this, this isn't new information. I've, I've been, um, communicating with, um, with Ms. Uh, with world tech for the last several months on, you know, on this. Cause I mean, we, I remember us, you know, just about a year ago when we started to, uh, look at costs that we had programmed, um, ferry street at 25 million. Cause that was what was available at the time, but there was, cause the design submission had just come in and, um, you know, I don't want to point at this project specifically because I think that the city and I want to personally recommend, you know, uh, uh, to note that World Tech really turned around a very, very uh, complicated and large project in in a short amount of time. I mean, our concern was in delivering this within the time frame. There were 300 plus uh, easements that the city council will vote on next week, turning around the plans and, uh, you know, 300 sheets uh, of the project. So I want to make sure that that's not, uh, that that's recognized and doesn't fall to the, uh, the bottom of the cutting room floor when uh, we try to make this thing fit within constraint. So we are trying to work on that. On the new Boston street, there were some design changes that were required because of the T and because of EPA um, and some private interests, uh, right of way impacts, uh, that we're also working through to try and bring closure to those numbers. I don't have um, complete numbers that, you know, bringing that cost more in line, but we're, uh, we're working very, very diligently with both designers on those two projects. There, um, I don't have all the numbers that Matt had shared, but I know that um, other projects in the, in the 21, um, I think Littleton, Littleton Air uh, was a, just about seven hundred thousand dollars. I think Framingham was just under a million dollars. Uh, Reading uh, was uh, also in there, and 
those are the three others that I had on my list that my team is is working on. Um, obviously, inflation. There's some cost increases from uh, when the project was was originally programmed, but we have been seeing favorable um, bids over the last three or four months on projects, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time for our cost estimator application to get the more recent information and not average it across the whole year. So although inflation has obviously increased, we've been getting more favorable bids over the last three months. And I want my team to look at the, the more up-to-date information and see if we can bring closure to some of the constraint issues. Thank you, John. Eric, did you have a follow-up question or is that good? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to the extent that we can understand um, you know, what is, what is driving this? I mean, this has been an issue I feel like we've grappled with for the past, you know, at least three or four tip cycles have, have been, you know, increased cost and, and just how that then has the ripple effect. I think we, we do really do need to have a serious conversation about, you know, about learning from this and just how we're doing this every year now. So maybe it does make sense to, to leave some funding you know, unprogrammed, so we have some ability to address what seems like just you know a, a trend of, of increasing costs uh, every year. So something something to think about. Thanks, Eric. Brian King. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I I wonder if I might call upon your um, well well renowned uh, uh, amazing memory. Uh, um, if we can go back a year, if memory serves, um, I believe Everett, the city of Everett last year, very magnanimously uh, agreed to move the Ferry Street project to this year, if memory serves, or split it up or do something very, um, that helped us out a lot. So um, that to me suggests that, um, that Ferry Street deserves strong consideration, but my, my, my real question uh, has to do with Rutherford Ave and, and your memory, David, of what did we decide to do on Rutherford Ave and what were the implicit uh, promises that were referenced? Thank you. Yes, so and that's gonna lead into a discussion about other cost overruns. Um, so what we decided on Rutherford Ave and Rutherford Ave has been in the long range plan for a while. It is, it is a commitment in the long range plan Last year, I believe we programmed it over, I guess, four years, right? And with, with, the, with the knowledge that there was a fifth year of construction, right? So when we, when we decided to program it, the, the overall construction cost, I think, is around was around $146 million. And we programmed through the first four years, now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 120, 121, right? To Matt's point, leaving $25 million for year five, for year five, which is now going to be year five of this year. Okay, so that was a commitment we made. <clears throat> In addition to that, the Rutherford Avenue project currently has a cost estimate of somewhere around 175, 177 million dollars. So there is approximately 33 million dollars worth of cost overruns for Rutherford Avenue, in Matt's big number of 69 million dollars worth of cost overruns. So to keep our commitment to Rutherford Avenue, we need to have 25 million in 25 or 26, plus 33 million spread somewhere over the life of the project in order to, to get that project done at its current cost estimate of 175 to 177 million dollars. Does Tom Kansas, you have your hand up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, with the discussion of Rutherford Ave, um, I'll just provide some comments. Um, to begin with, I, in my, I've heard the word overruns, overruns, overruns. In, in my opinion, these are not overruns. This is how this is how this MPO operates, and it does not, it does not give a. Uh, what it does is it's conservative with the design, the, the concept, because it does not assume, for example, that the project will need retaining walls. 
it does not assume it will need this or that. What happens is once we get into the 25%, and we've seen this today, the board heard from several project proponents regarding uh, cost adjustments identified. Uh, Rutherford Ave is similar to the projects discussed in terms of the, co the known cost relative to the design maturity. We've seen proportionally larger increases at the 25% versus the 75% or beyond. This, is, this has been going on for as long as I've been in the MPO and uh, Eric, uh, Mr. Barasa is right. Uh, we're trying to come to grips with this. There've been talks about, uh, about uh, how, how, to, how to put some fudge factors in there. We've had Beth Harvey or the uh, Rebuild America come in and talk about uh, cost effectiveness. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky topic, but in my opinion, they're not overruns. What they are is their, their costs that are more accurate as, as we get into the design. The problem with Rutherford is that the size of the project magnifies the increase. So, Mr. Kane, you, you said that y'all gonna support um, Everett if their increase. Well, Ferry Street came in at 17%. We're gonna support that. Route 2A came in at 33% increase. These are what we're seeing today. We're gonna support that. The new Boston Bridge, 27%. We're gonna support it. Broadway, Everett. 35%, Peabody, 58%, Bedford, 62%, Milford, Route 16, 162%. The problem we have with Rutherford is the size of the project. The, it's a complex project as things have become clearer and as the delays that we've had to deal with switching designs in, in the impact of inflation are clear. The chair is summed it up basically is like we've, we've got to figure it out. Uh, we've got to figure out where the schedule is, where the funding comes from. Um, as far as Boston's concerned, we're going to support every project that's been on this list uh, because we've done it all the time. Now, you know, Eric, you said the last three cycles. I beg to differ. I'd, I'd, I'd remind everybody and many people weren't here about uh, what was it, Route 128? I mean, Route 28 in the South Shore, a great regional project that one year, it blew our tip up. What was this, 10 years ago, $33 million increase. A great project, a project that it turned out uh, to, to in, improve the project and to make it work. You had to add exclusive left turn lanes that involved land taking. It didn't mean that it was a bad idea and the, and the tip supported it. Uh, with that being said, the finances of the Boston MPO are finite and the city recognizes that. Um, there's talk in Congress of reinstituting uh, earmarks. Uh, there seems to be on both sides of the aisle, there's some interest in that, although, although maybe that's being too optimistic. But the question that, that uh, the gentleman, that the, uh, my colleague from the MBTA advisory board you know, asked about what did we agree to Rutherford Ave, what we agreed was $141 million programming that's set out in the TIP and the long range plan. It's, a lot, it's, it's the only project that spans uh, into the next TIP, I believe, Matt. And so there we are, that's what we have. Uh, Rutherford Ave is the same as every project here in, this, in the terms of how it's performing with the cost increase. I, I, I disagree with the notion that it's a cost overrun. It's not a cost overrun because the design elements that are required are now known. With that said, it's a cost increase and I'm dealing with semantics to a standpoint and we've got a, we've got a problem to deal with. I, I, don't, I don't dispute that. I don't think that we're going to solve it today, though. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Don. Next up is Jay Monty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I guess I want to echo uh, Mr. Kazis's points here. I, I think 
we, we clearly have something baked into the system that does this to us on a, on a perennial basis. Um, you know, having walked through Ferry Street for seven years now, um, and it's a combination of, of a lot of things. But I'll point out that between 75% and 100%, you know, there was really no scope change at all that I'm aware of. And in fact, during that time, the city, um, as was noted, has absorbed uh, $6 million in non participating costs to um, deal with some of the, the increases. Uh, but you know, to, to Tom's point about this being an overrun, I, I, I tend to agree with them that this is, this is probably a, not quite a fair way to um, characterize this. If you look at how we're estimating these costs, you know, we're estimating by the unit prices known at the time given to us by um, you know people doing their best at, at, at MassDOT and, and other agencies. Um, it's not their fault, but um, you know, clearly every time we update the estimate, we're dealing with new unit prices. We're dealing with new um, issues that whether or not we can foresee them, I, I think is, is up for debate. Um, but I, I think, you know, overrun is, is a, or that sometimes, you know, implies that uh, somebody wasn't doing their, their due diligence and keeping costs under control. And some of this really, I think is baked into um, the process that we, we followed um, for the past number of years in estimating these projects and, and budgeting these, these projects. So, um, you know, I think anything we can do going forward to, um, you know, again, use the word fudge factor. I, I think it's a, Maybe there's a better word for it, but um, we're, we're not accounting for something because, you know, to Tom's point, um, you see the percentage costs of increase being similar across the projects, whether, you know, there's, there's a, a larger percentage from 25 to 75 and there's a smaller percentage from 75 to 100. But as you walk through them, um, those percentages at each, at each point there tend to be not too far off. I mean, you know, we're, we're very street, we're, um, you know, a little over 10%. Um, similar to, to Rutherford, um, and you know we've been more than that when it was between 25 and 75. So, um, you know, again, no easy answers here, but I think um, I, I don't want to suggest that we should uh, you know reduce our commitment to any of the projects here. Uh, I don't think that it, it, it's the, the fault of um, the municipalities or anybody um, you know working on these projects, but you know we we have to do a better job at um, creating realistic um, budgets and estimates. I think. Um, and if we have to shuffle projects, I mean, we Everett stepped up last year to, to Brian, Brian pointed this out, we stepped up and we've, we've taken, um, I guess this is originally program 2017 or 2018. So we've, we've um, absorbed a few, a few years of um, delay. Um, and I think we're, we're willing to do that because of the commitment. And so um, that, that may be the option going forward here is to, um, you know, ask some folks to, um, you know, have their project put up, pushed out a year if they haven't already done so. Thank you. Yep. Rich Benevento. Thank you. Um, just want to echo a little bit of what's already been said relative to uh, Everett, but but just just sort of in general, I think you know from the design side, uh, you know estimates start out at PRC level. Uh, they're generally order of magnitude. You know, you try try and do the best uh, guess estimate without actually having full survey and shovels in the ground and that sort of thing. And I think just as the projects advance. You know, 25%, we have a better idea. 75%, an even better idea. Uh, you know, we're doing cores. In, in the case of Everett, for example, um, there's, a, there's a concrete base underneath Ferry Street. And, you know, that, uh, that was discovered during the boring program. Uh, so as the projects move along, uh, new projects are, are new uh, uh, items are presenting themselves. Similarly, as the projects um, age, um, we're hit by inflation and I mean, gosh, uh, mix used to be 25 bucks a ton in place. Now it's 120 bucks a ton in place, you know, so there's, there's sort of that inflation uh, that goes with it as well. I think from the design side, at least the communities that I'm working with, one of the things that I know the MPO has, has really had concerns about is scope creep. Uh, and I don't think that, that Ferry Street, I can speak for Ferry Street, and this wasn't like we were expanding the project. I think it was just a question of discovering new Things that were coming up. One of the uh, one of the elements that came up really near the end of the of the design phase was uh, issues with national grid and issues with the MBTA and that sort of thing. So um, I, I, I again I don't think it's a scope creep uh, uh, item. Uh, one of the projects that um, that's also on the list with with some red numbers next to it is Peabody Central Street. And so the question that that comes to mind is well where did that number come from? Because our office estimate. Uh, is 10.2 million. 
Uh, now, granted, it's on the tip for 9.66 million. That represents about a 5.8% increase. Uh, again, we're in 25% design. Uh, as we go through that design, we're certainly trying to value engineer as we go, um, identifying items that are non-participating. So for example, our office, our total office estimate is 12.12 million because there's $2 million in water system improvements that are not part of uh, the programming dollar. So, um, you know, again, it, it's showing, it's showing on, the, uh, on the MPO list at 15.2 million really not sure where that came from, again, given that our office estimate is 10.2. Um, so just, you know, again, there may be some discrepancies in these as well. Happy to work with, uh, with Matt and the programming folks. And certainly we're, we're working closely with MassDOT as well as, as John Bouchard had mentioned, uh, just to make sure that we're keeping these numbers in check, uh, that we're not, uh, that we're not um, engaging in scope creep but again, as the as the define as the designs get more and more and more refined as we go along, you know things come up, and sometimes they come up where we can actually save some money, and on a, and and on the other hand, sometimes things come up that are actually going to increase the project costs at nobody's fault. It's just like we you know the shovels were in the ground, and this is what we found. So, just thought I'd offer that. <laughs> Steve Olinoff. Unmute Steve Olinoff, please. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm confused about the non-participating costs here. Are they are they being included in these cost changes? That so it's really not no. our responsibility. No. So so these are the costs. These are the federal participating costs. So non non-participating costs should not be reflected in the total TFPC. They are in addition to. So when John. Costs reflected here, then these costs are wrong. The MPO does not, the mass does not participate in non participating costs. The federal government does not participate in non federal, federal non participating costs. Those costs are in addition to the TFPC amount. Right, John? Can you unmute John Bichard? So he can say I'm right or tell, him, tell me I'm wrong. David, your audio cut out significantly in the middle of what you just said, so I'm not sure that anyone caught that. Thank you. So what I said was non-participating costs should not be included in the TIP costs. By definition, Mass Highway doesn't participate in those costs, neither does the federal government. They are in addition to the TIP costs. So if there are in a, inappropriately non-participating costs are, are included here, these numbers are, are wrong and that's that's a failure of ours. But John, what I, I believe the Ferry Street project is $28 million, $29 million without the non-participating costs. Is that correct? John, somebody unmute John, please. They unmuted me finally, David. <laughs> um, the the cost that was submitted with the PS and E was 20, just over 24 million when we add on our you you know our add-ons for construction for con for traffic police and contingencies, it pushed it close to uh, twenty eight million dollars. Yes, that's correct. So and the non participating should not be listed. Um, it's you know because we're programming to TFPC, and if there are you know if we don't have enough money in the region, uh, sometimes there are items added to the project that the community will pay for to be able to maintain constraint. Right. So the cost of the Ferry Street project as advertised is going to be more than $28 million because of the non-participating cost. But the, yes. share, the MPO share is approximately $28 million. Yes, that's correct. Right. Ken Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I was, I was going to say something similar that we have to be careful about talking about the total federal participating cost versus the office estimate. The total federal participating cost includes other items not included in the office estimate. So you can't really, uh, uh, just like the things here John mentioned, the uh, details, construction, engineering, other contingencies and things like that. So, uh, so Rex, just be careful about office estimate versus total federal participating cost. 
Dave Monty? I want to uh, John just clarify. Um, you know, obviously the the the, the office that comes in, you guys add on um, those costs you mentioned. Do you know, police, uh, construction, administration, all those things. Um, are those things that are known? You know, before the the PSNE comes in, are those is that a cost that? Because um, it seems like this happens where, um, at least in my mind, we work with an off office estimate. Um, and then we hand it off, and then you know this, this, these other costs um, get tacked on, and, and they're and they're justifiable costs without arguing that they they aren't. But uh, I'm just I'm just wondering, is that a number that you know we we are we should be aware of sooner um, that our designer should be aware of sooner? Um, is it a number that you only calculate after um, the product's been submitted? Because that, that it's a significant number, and I think that that's one. Um, and I look at Perry Street, so that's the entire you know overrun. Um, is that something we should have factored in earlier? So, John, I'll, yeah. yeah. So, John, let me let me try first, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, so yes, at your 25% design, there's an estimate, and then there's a TFPC that is that assumes what those costs are. That is primarily based on as a function of a percentage of the cost of the project. Okay. Right? Not exact, not exclusively, but as so so as the costs increase, and I you know. I understand the semantics of, of cost overrun versus cost increase, but as the costs increase over time, those percentages don't change, but the dollar figure increases over time right. because it's a percentage, all right? So, so on, I would note that, that without casting aspersions on anybody, whether this is a, a cost increase or a cost scope or a cost overrun, there is something systemically wrong with this process, right? We start with a budget at 25%. We, we theoretically put some contingency in that budget that says, hey, this is a 25% number, it's gonna change. And then we go to 75% and then we go to 100. <clears throat> and then we get to 100 and there's a change again. The, the, this is to Eric's point, to Tom Katz's point, to everybody's point. This is a longstanding systemic problem, okay? There are two ways to fix this in my view. We can either, as, as a community of practitioners, get better at budgeting and at maintaining cost discipline over time, or we can change our four-year inflation, four percent inflation assumption. Because I will note for everybody who came here today and said, oh, that's a cost of unit cost increases. These costs all included a four percent inflation adjustment by year from the first year they were included in the tip. Okay. That 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 there's a there's an inflation cost. That cost should have already been reflected last year when we when we inflated everybody's cost by four percent. Now, to Rich's cost, Rich's point, sometimes inflation of a unit price is more than four percent. Got it. Okay, but but it's really not. Oh, that's just that's just normal process. We're supposed to because Federal Highway makes us do a year of, year of expenditure. It should be reflecting already the fact that by the time it gets delivered from the year it's programmed, costs have increased by four percent. Okay, so so so. If the MPO wants, we could certainly talk about maybe in this MPO, we should assume a 10% cost increase per year. And then if you're programming a project this year, at, you know, that's four years out, assume it's, you know, 40% more than you said, than we said it was. You know, at some point we've, we've got to figure this out because we're at a point now, as Matt showed earlier in his presentation, there's, I forget how many, how many Matt, how many projects did you score? 26, 27? Uh, yeah, that's correct. We scored 27 projects this year. How much do they cost, Matt? Uh, so if you uh, include sort of the community connections projects that we programmed in uh, 2022, uh, it's right around $300 million. Right. We were never going to be able to do $300 million, but we sort of thought we might be able to do 100. And now we actually can do what? 60? What do we, what, what, what do we have available as of now, Matt? Uh, so if you include the, if we assume that we fund all the remainder of Rubber and Avenue in, in 2026, then we have $3 million left for other projects. Right, right. We've got $300 million of, of, of projects we've scored. We thought we'd have $100 million of projects to be able to do. Well, actually not 100 because because we always had our $25 million commitment to Rutherford. So we thought we had 75 or to Matt's other, we had some community connections. Roughly $69 million of what we thought we'd have. We've got three, right? There is a systemic, terrible problem that we have to figure out how to fix. 
John Bouchard. Um, that is something that we're working on at the highway division, David, you know, um, there's to answer Mr. Monty's question, the, uh, the, the add-ons to the project are when the project first comes in for approval through our project review committee, PRC, uh, there's a cost that is associated with it. And then we, we, and we factor that with items that, um, are required to deliver the project that would make the, you know, the total federal participating cost, you know, it's generally about 20 to 25%. And then the, you know, and, and some of that's the inflation factor. Um, but we are working on improved um, mechanisms, putting a mechanism in place so that way we can, uh, you know, uh, track this and keep our cost in line with what was the original, um, what was originally submitted for approval at the PRC stage, such that, um, when we factor in those add-ons, uh, that when we get to the end of the line, final design and everything's more refined that, you know, that we're closer and we're not looking at tip adjustments all the time to, um, to be able to uh, advertise the project. So we are putting measures in place there. It is a sy systemic problem as, uh, David stated, um, and it's it's something we're working on. It's it it was occurring long before I came to the highway division, and uh, and we're trying to put in measure, trying to put in place measures to uh, you know do a better job and correct this stuff. Uh, Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, so you know. I, I guess we had someone be from Virginia or something come to talk with us about the uh, cost effective it, um, cost effectiveness and and part of that was that it, as I recall me some entity kind of helps me in the planning process be so that be, by the time we, we do the budgeting we a, an entity like us does the budgeting, we have a much better sense of what that cost is going to be. I mean, essentially, some entity has to have the ability to flux the cost. I mean, uh, so, or, and, and so that when it gets to us, I mean, and we have very little ability to kind of um, flux what we have. I mean, um, and, and once we assign it to a, a project, then we feel that we have an obligation to it. And I totally understand that. I mean, and so we don't want to let towns think something's going to happen and then they start planning on that and then we can't do it. I mean, so, so I, mean, I think at some point soon now, we're just going to have to say we're not doing anything I mean, for a year because we just don't have the money. I mean, um, and then uh, we get a reserve of money I mean, for the following year and then we maybe spend only half of it because until we change the process, we can assume that a big chunk of the money you know, that we have given to, a, to the various projects, we're gonna to have to spend more of it in order because they're gonna be overruns because of the nature of our process. And one other thing I'll say about the process itself, let's say we do say that it's gonna be a 10% increase. We should compound that, I mean, so that when we're looking four years out, we're not looking at simply 40%, we compound it because that's gonna be a higher number and that might be more realistic. Thank you. Don Katz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, an unusual request. I have a. Um, I I'm going to have to leave this call because I've got a com I've got a Comcast. I've had problems with my uh, <laughs> internet, and I'm gonna. I, I've got a. He's here a little earlier. Is there any other questions in, on Rutherford Ave? If if I could ask, uh, Mr. Chair, because uh, I'm going to uh, be my plug's going to be pulled in a few minutes. Th thank you. I'll I'll take a step back and see if there are. If you have a question, let's uh, let me know in the chat box because right now I'm going to call the people who had their hand raised. <coughs> Rich Benevento. You're, you're muted, Rich. We can't hear you yet. Sorry about that. Um, so, you, you know, um, Mr. Chairman, one of the comments uh, about, you know, sort of getting a better idea of where these estimates are and that there's that 4% that's already built in. I think one of the things from the design side um, is that oftentimes if we, if, if designers, I can't speak for all of them, I'm just, uh, it, it's a guess, I guess, but if, you know, if you see that the program demand is 25 million, the designer is designing to 25 million, only to find out as Jeopardy Chief Bouchard mentioned that there's all of these add-ons afterwards. 
So um, Ken Miller, you'll love this. Uh, we, we, we have a group that's been trying to assemble a stakeholder partnering group, right, from EDC2. Uh, and uh, we're trying to, to, uh, to discuss some of these things so that we're, we're having a better handle on things like estimating. So the, so the contract advertising and planning estimator, which MassDOT uses, um, I think that uh, hopefully that's going to be um, distributed to the consultant community as well. So that as we're going through our design, we're designing to a number that's actually, let's say, for example, it's 25 million. We're designing something less than 25 million, right? Because we have to add on all of these other things like construction contingencies and construction engineering and police and all those other things. I mean, if you could give you a good example, the, the total amount for police on the Ferry Street project uh, the federal aid piece is nine nine hundred thousand, and the and the NFA piece is four hundred thousand, just in police. Um, so you know that hopefully in the future things like that are being considered as the designer is putting the estimate together as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Ken. Uh, am I? Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking about, uh, I was going to mention uh, designing to a number, but in a different context. Uh, I know in the Pioneer, in the Pioneer Valley, uh, there was a project years ago, Pioneer Valley MPO, that uh, kept on going up in price. It was uh, on a, uh, a road, it was $9 million on a road that had an ADT of about 1500 and the, and the price kept on going up. And finally, the MPO said, you know what? Uh, community, I'm not going to mention what town it was, but they said, you know what, you have $7 million, period. If you go over it, uh, it's on you. We, the MPO is only kicking in $7 million. Uh, so there are, in terms of designing to a number, uh, this MPO could decide, you know what, uh, you know, at some point, we're going to uh, let a community design to a number, or let the state for that matter, design to a number, and then that's it. Uh, and uh, that will help uh, mitigate uh, uh, scope creep. Uh, the, the designers, Rick, everybody should know uh, how uh, a total federal participating cost is estimated. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that, uh, that that's the way things work. So um, uh, it's also, there's also an option for the MPO to, to tell folks, hey, this is what you got, live with it. Again, yeah, yes, I would know. In, in, in agreement with Ken, that we continue to always in this NPO say, well, we've got to keep our commitments to projects. That that's fine. If that's our policy. That's our that's fine. But that does not impose any kind of discipline, cost budget discipline on anyone. Okay. There 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 is a pos there is a strong possibility that as an NPO member, I would look at a project and say, at ten million dollars, that's a good project. At 15, it's not, and yet we don't seem to care, and that's okay. If that's our policy. That's 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 fine. That's our policy, right? I do understand that that, that we've also told towns design the project, spend your own money. We'll, we're good for it. I understand that issue, but there, but there, the, the the concept of well, that's what the project costs now. It 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 it's a little hard to take sometimes. Samantha. Thank you, David. So um, that, that was a, a bit of, uh, I think, foreshadowing for the point I was going to make. So at the T, um, over the last year or so, we've implemented a new process for our projects um, for mostly in-year cost, uh, cost increases and reallocations, where we have different tracks based on the uh, both percentage of the cost increase and the, the absolute value of the cost increase. And I, I know we've talked about it before here, but but I would strongly recommend us considering um, if a project has a significant cost increase, and we can talk about what significant means again by either absolute value or or proportion of baseline cost. It should be, in my view, reevaluated. And I don't know if that means that we do the full scoring from end to end or we at least bring it forward for consideration, but there is a kind of fundamental moral hazard um, um, issue if we're saying that you can increase, 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 and, and, and the MPO will just be a, your bank forever. So, so point one, kind of 
I think just in general, it makes sense. Point two is that, and the T is grappling with this too, when I've presented about our forging ahead, you know, reevaluation, the world has changed. Um, and, and I don't, I, I can't speak to any of these specific projects, but in general, um, decisions that we as a board made three or four or five years ago um, may not still be the no brainer decisions that they were pre COVID. Um, commuting patterns are changing, land use patterns may be changing. Um, and, and so I, I, I know that the, the CTPS staff, the MPO staff is extremely thoughtful and this board is very thoughtful, but you know, if there are projects on this list in particular ones that are seeing significant cost overruns that don't make sense or don't make as much sense in this current world, um, or even if there are scope elements that don't make as much sense in the current world, I, I would encourage us to, to take a hard look at that because um, again, it, it, while I know many of these increases are unavoidable, um, it does raise the, the, the question and the point of what we are crowding out and what valuable and important investments uh, for this post-COVID world that we're no longer able to make um, because, because these projects are coming in so far over. So to sum, one, let's, let's take a hard look at everything given you know, what we know about the world now and, and what things you know, make sense and don't make sense. And two, I know we've talked about cost effectiveness before. I remember Beth Osborne's presentation and others but I, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to have thresholds at which we take another hard look at projects before we automatically say that they're in for the next year. Thanks. Thank you, Samantha. Brian, King? Well, I'm really glad I asked that question an hour ago. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Mr. Chairman, for just I'm a bottom line kind of person. With everything that we have quote unquote committed to, what number do we have to hit? Right. So, so let's talk about that in two different two different ways. For this year that we're currently in advertising projects, we can't afford to advertise all the projects we promised. Okay. I think Matt said the number is probably around eleven million dollars. Matt, that's correct. We got to cut eleven million dollars worth of projects, or we've got to figure out a way to fund some of these projects over two years and cut $11 million of the projects that you don't see on the screen, but are somebody else's projects in the next year, okay? Right? Okay. We can cut projects by deciding we're not gonna do one. We can cut projects by deciding we're gonna do it next year. We can, we can try to not cut any projects and move cash flow into next year, but it has that ripple effect throughout the tip. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing to Matt's point is, if we wanted to keep all of our existing commitments to all the projects in, this, in the TIP, including their cost increases, okay, for FY20, we don't have to take anybody's project out of the TIP, but in FY26, we'll only be adding $3 million worth of new projects, which is probably, frankly, gonna be difficult to find $3 million worth of a project. And at that point, why, why review $300 million worth of projects to add a 3 million, to choose one for 3 million? That's just my own perspective. Well, I mean, your perspective is very valuable because you've been doing this for a very long time. And, and um, I guess the, the next question I have is when, when do we have to make this decision and what's the best way to move forward? I mean, do you want to appoint a subcommittee of people? I mean, because doing this this way with all these people is hard, right? Is this especially on Zoom? Yep. Um, so, you know, given your expertise and your experience, David, what what, what do you think we should do, and, and what's the timeline? Right. Okay. So, so the overall timeline is the tip development is going to happen beginning the next meeting, or no, I guess the next meeting will be an update on project readiness. Okay, because this is only one half of the picture, right? Yeah, I know. So yeah. far, we've talked about cost overruns. We haven't talked about whether people's projects are actually going to be ready and then time their programs. My assumption is that all the ones on this screen are because they're scheduled for this year. And I, I, I hope that none of them aren't going to make it, right? Or at least aren't going to make it because of readiness issues. They may not make it because of funding issues. But we have to next, at our next meeting, we will discuss in greater detail project readiness. At that meeting, Matt will have done his outreach to all the communities and they will all come in and talk about what they think readiness is compared to what we think readiness is. And we'll have that discussion. Tip, actual tip development happens in March. So we have to decide all of this in March. 
Yeah. Now, there's a there's a part of me that says some of these projects that, I'm, that are on the screen now, theoretically, want to already be might be ready to be advertised before March. So there's a chance that we might actually want to do this part earlier. I don't know that that's going to be possible. So my my best estimate is that we're going to do all of this in March, but it has to get done in March because we have to have a, a, it feeds into the CIP and and then and, you know so. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions, comments, concerns, issues? All right, seeing none, we'll have more of this discussion in two weeks. And I believe the next thing on our, on our agenda is a presentation, I believe, from MAPC on, yes, on Metro Common Update. And Sarah Philbrick, thank you for being here and sitting through this discussion. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I am going to share my, oh, you have my presentation up. Thank you. Um, great. So um, I am here to talk to you um, a little bit about a, a general update on Metro Common, but more specifically about our scenario planning process. And I think um, that ties in with how the scenario planning process at the MPO might unfold over the next few uh, months or a year. So um, happy to share our process right now. All right, so for those of you unfamiliar with Metro Common, Metro Common is the region's uh, next long range plan, um, a land use plan, but so much more. So this is the general format of what Metro Common is. We sort of worked over the last few years to develop a shared vision and goals for what we want the region to look like in 2050 with, with lots of stakeholders. And then the plan is in addition to those visions and goals, how do we get to those goals? So we have um, an analysis on the challenges and opportunities in our way that we've heard from folks, uh, short-term policy recommendations about how to get closer to those goals in the next five years or so, and then strategies about how to get to those goals over the next 30 years, because we're looking all the way out to 2050. In addition to that, um, those action areas or how we're getting to the goals, we also have done a scenario planning analysis, which helps us understand how we might be able to prepare for an uncertain future. Um, and we've been publishing research over the past few years and will continue to publish research that helps provide more insight about the region so that people have the tools they need to, to achieve these goals. Uh, we'll also have a variety of tools like data sets and um, new types of calculations or new data sets or new um, ideas about how people can actually implement this at their local level. So the idea of the scenario planning piece is that the future is based on things both inside and outside of our control at the regional level. We have the opportunity and both and responsibility really to plan for a future that's uncertain, which is um, resonates with folks now more than ever because of COVID. So the way we've been describing this is that policies tailored to today's needs might not work in the same way under different conditions. We have a strategy or a policy that we're advocating for that is really based on the way the world works today. And that might work really well under what we think the future looks like. It might work pretty well under a very different future, even if we're not sure what that looks like. But there are also some futures where that strategy might not work so well. So. Uh, an example I've been giving, if you think way, way back, um, if we had planned for only horses and buggies to exist uh, throughout the future, we might not have had the type of infrastructure that we needed for automobiles. And, and that's just sort of one example. I'm sure you can think of many more that we've experienced in our lifetimes of, of what these big technology or, or, or uh, lifestyle changes might be going forward. So I just want to preview some of the goals uh, that we're trying to get through through all these process. Not surprisingly, there are things that, um, that everyone wants, economic prosperity and security, uh, healthy and safe neighborhoods, homes for all, the ability to move around the region, a climate resilient region. This is sort of our, our dream state of what the region should look like in 2050. And so we've examined three uncertainties in this plan that um, are sort of these known unknowns, things we know will change in the future, but we don't necessarily know how much or in which direction. 
that might um, create some challenges for us to get to those goals. So one are sort of regional demographics in the economy, who's living in the region, how many people are living in the region, how many jobs and what type. The other is the future of travel, which I know is very relevant to this group, sort of uh, what types of technology we'll have available, but also how much people will want to be moving around, how many of our meetings will be remote, how many will be in person. And then the third is federal policy, which is really about the context that this region and our state needs to work within in order to get things done. So I'm going to walk through just an example of the type of engagement we did with regional demographics in the economy. We've done engagement on all three of these. I'm going to show you what we've been proposing to folks and then talk a little bit about how we're using that. Um, so those uncertainties were uh, created from a group of internal and external advisory staff over the past few years. They were chosen, like I said, because they're sort of our known unknowns. They have a high likelihood of changing the region and would have a large impact on the region. And some folks who might have seen um, examples of scenario planning in other regions might have seen uh, a lot of people create sort of stories about, okay, you wake up in 2050 and this is what your day looks like. How, how would we have to respond to that? Um, and we have created quite a few of those um, at the end of 2019 and sort of scrapped that for our public engagement effort because a lot of them felt pretty dystopian and we uh, felt after COVID-19 people were already <laughs> sort of living in a dystopian environment and understood, you know, that the future could change really rapidly. So as I mentioned, we, we did um, some engagement on each of these. I'm going to walk through what that engagement activity is. We don't have time to do it today, but uh, we do have this up on our website if folks want to you know, send ideas about what they think uh, their input would be. So we sort of talk through the things we know about each of these. With demographics in the economy, we're talking specifically about the relationship between demographics and housing. So we explained that the, the combination of a supply and demand imbalance and increasing income inequality in the region has helped lead to this housing unaffordability crisis. We have a lot of people wanting to move to the region, um, not a lot of housing supply, and we have really this bifurcation of, of income. So we have a lot of people who are, willing, or who are able to bid up the cost of housing, which makes it even harder for low-income folks and middle-income folks to find housing. We also know that the idea of a traditional household is changing. Uh, folks are tending to have children later in life, if at all. Uh, people live with roommates more often. There's lots of multi-generational family housing that um, has always existed but is growing in number. And we also know that baby boomers um, are reaching retirement age and may free up housing as they age or if, they, they, if they're given the opportunity, uh, want to downsize. We also have the things we think we know. So those are the things we know about how the region works. We have these possible solutions that are sort of uh, approaches that MAPC and our allies have been talking about for a long time, reducing barriers to housing production um, and expanding inclusionary zoning and encouraging ho housing adaptation of buildings that aren't currently housing, home ownership programs, sort of like our bread and butter policies that we keep pushing for. But then the question we've been asking folks is really, how would these policies actually work or would they be more or less important given different uncertainties about the future? So we gave them an, um, three possible futures, one where there's sort of a stagnant housing market, where it could be a long recession or uh, declining school and university enrollment, meaning fewer young people might move to our region. And we said, okay, if the growth in housing demand is slower, what does that mean for these policies? Alternatively, if we have an economic boom scenario, we have um, a lot of people attracted to our region, what would that mean for the demand for housing or for these policies? And we have this other scenario about a possibility of a boomer exodus where many baby boomers think the cost of ho housing is too high and uh, they just would prefer to leave the region. So given all of that, we, we gave people this uh, slide and they were put into breakout groups to sort of make these connections between the strategies in the future. For example, um, reducing regulatory barriers to housing production 
might be less effective but still worthwhile if the housing market is stagnant because the the weak market conditions could dampen production even if barriers are removed. And so we people sort of walked through and gave different examples of, well, I think this is a really important strategy. This one's not so important. This would have to be changed in this way. And we took all that feedback to help us help inform um, what strategies we should be we think are sort of robust or a really good idea under any future, and then what strategies only work well under certain features and we sort of have to keep an eye on. So this approach of scenario planning really allows us to prepare for different possible futures um, that differ from current trends. As uh, many of you have probably seen with the last LRTP um, or, or future, or you know, LRTPs in the past, we uh, create a projection of how many people will live in the region, how many jobs will live in the region, where they are, and we sort of plan for that. But this idea allows us to think of the fact that we don't really know what will happen in the future, and we have to prepare for a range of things. Um, again, it also enhances this idea that the future depends on things outside of our control, but also the choices that we make. So we can sort of guide things um, depending on what's thrown our way. It also helps us think about this question of what does it mean to actually be ready for these uncertainties and um, helps us craft our strategies and policies going forward. I also wanted to highlight one thing that's coming out of this plan that is extremely relevant to the MPO planning process and future long-range transportation plans potentially. So, Throughout the metro common process, we developed six different population scenarios for the region. We sort of have our business as usual, which is what's used in the LRTP, um, and a higher growth and a lower growth. We also uh, created three other scenarios that are sort of uh, differing trends from what we've been seeing and not just turning the dial up or down. So we have, uh, when we made these, um, Migration of um, or international in migration was a po big political topic and could be in coming years. So we looked at what does it mean for the Boston region if the federal government limits in migration to the re to the to the United States. Um, like I just gave that example, what does it mean if older folks decide to leave the region um, in rates higher than they have in the past? And then we have this other scenario that we're calling sleepy region which is actually very similar to COVID, like where people are sort of moving around the United States at much lower rates. You sort of are born somewhere and you continue to live there. You don't really move out. You don't really move in. You have less college students moving in. And what would that mean for the Boston region? This is a little bit more detail about, you know, the assumptions that went into each of those, which I won't go over today because I know we're, we're well over time and folks are probably hungry. But what we wind up with is uh, a range of different populations for the Metro Boston region that allows us to think about what the needs of folks might be. So in the solid gray here, we have the 2015 population by age. And then all of these hollow um, square or rectangles are sort of what the different scenarios say the population might be in the future. So one thing that we can see is that, you know, the the range, even under all these different scenarios of older adults in our region is still much higher than what we saw in 2015. So no matter what, we're going to have to prepare for a region with many more uh, folks age 65 plus than we have right now. That's not, you know, sort of news to anyone who's, who thinks about long-term futures, but that is uh, interesting for us to note. But then you have sort of like this child age population, you can see across the different scenarios, you have a pretty big range compared to what we have today, which has implications for school planning and types of housing we need, et cetera. So this really allows us to think through quantitatively what the impacts of some of these um, uncertainties are. In addition to the demographic modeling, we also have uh, over the past few years been developing a new land use model and have been coordinating with <clears throat> MPO staff who uh, work on travel demand models to see how these two interact. And um, one exciting thing, we've transitioned to an urban sim modeling platform, which is a new software. Um, we've been working, like I said, over the past few years to sort of estimate and calibrate these models to our region. And the inputs are these detailed population, household, and employment projections. Uh, like I just showed in the last slide, that could be an input into this model. 
Um, so we could say, okay, under a high growth scenario, what, where might people live in the region? Or under a low growth scenario, where might people live in the region? Because the model actually allocates household and employment across the region based on location choice model specific to household segments or industries. So there's a different choice model for young families with children than there is for older adults. And that helps us understand where development might be in the future. The allocation is based off of historic patterns that we've seen. Um, development information we collect from all of our municipalities about projects that are either in construction or in planning uh, on our website called MassBuild. We use the CTPS travel model skims uh, to have accessibility as a variable into this model. And so if we have a scenario where transit accessibility really improves, that might change where people decide to live and zoning capacity, which we also have been collecting from all of our municipalities and have just published um, a zoning map for all 101 cities and towns in the, in the um, MAPC region recently. So that's an update on scenario planning with Metro Common. I think in addition to all of the things that helps us do in terms of informing the policies that we have in, um, in our plan and how we might advocate for them, it also, uh, those tools I talked about at the end have um, really exciting implications for how we might be able to do different um, planning with CTPS in the future, with the MPO about different um, land use and transportation scenarios that sort of talk back and forth. This is um, an idea of what's coming in the next few months with Metro Common. We are currently doing policy engagement with many different focus groups of experts and um, hard to reach populations that we're, that we're reaching through um, a series of mini grants that were given to community-based organizations. Uh, we're publishing a, a number of research releases over the next few months. And the whole plan uh, will be launched softly in July with adopt, adoption by our council, hopefully at the end of the summer. So we really have a lot of stuff coming out in the next few months. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for staying late. I know, like I said, that um, you all probably have places to be, but I really appreciate getting the opportunity to talk to you about what we're working on. Great. So David had to uh, run to a meeting with the new secretary. So um, he has passed on the, the chair to me. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah? Okay. Sarah, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that, the update. Um, if, if folks do have questions at some point, feel free to send me or, or Sarah an, an email. We're happy to, to talk about any of this. Um, let's see, Jonathan, can you put the schedule back up? What is next? Member items. Do we have any members items? I do not see anyone raising their hands. Okay, so in that case, can I get um, a motion to adjourn? Let's see, Tina Cassidy. Yes, good afternoon. I make a motion to adjourn this MPO meeting. Great. And um, Tom O'Rourke? I'll second that motion. Okay, then unless uh, I hear any objection, um, people can put their hands down if they don't object. Otherwise, I will, I'll call on you. Darlene, do you object? Tom doesn't object. Okay, right. unless I don't see any objection, then I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. This was great. Look forward to discussing uh, particularly these tip issues at another meeting. Okay, thank you. Great job, staff. Bye-bye.